Let us imagine a man who is sitting on a chair trying to look at a hexagon. Now, with his one eye closed, with his left eye, he is going to perceive one hexagon and with his right eye, he is going to perceive another hexagon, right? Now, however, what happens is that when he is looking at the hexagon with both his eyes, he is still going to perceive the hexagon as a single hexagon despite the two eyes making two individual images on their respective retina. Now, this is the concept of binocular single vision. That means over here in this diagram, the right eye fovea is actually casting one field of vision which is shown here in pink color and the left eye has another field of vision which is drawn in blue color and you can see that there is actually a significant over overlap between the two and this significant overlapping of the field of vision of the two eyes is something which is responsible for the binocular single vision right so basically when we use our two eyes simultaneously we get a common image from both the eyes superimposed on each other as if there was a cyclopean eye at the center of our forehead so i hope that is clear Right? So what exactly is binocular single vision? The binocular single vision is basically the ability to use both the eyes simultaneously so that each eye contributes to a common single perception. Now, it is very important for you to understand that the normal binocular single vision, which is abbreviated as BSV, is basically biphobial and there is no manifest deviation. Okay, so what I mean to say is that the images on both the eyes should form on the fovea of the two eyes and there should be no squint present in the patient. Then we say that that patient or person actually has a normal binocular single vision. Now, what are the requirements for the normal binocular vision to develop? Number one is that the patient or the person should actually have a proper eye alignment. That means there should be no squint. Second, there should be presence of sensory and motor fusion. And third is that there should be equal image clarity from both the eyes. So what I mean to say is that both the eyes should be able to form equally clear images on the retina there should not be very significant refractive error or there should not be any significant uh, problem of the visual axis like cataract or corneal opacity in one eye of course as we move ahead in this lecture we are going to talk about what is sensory and motor fusion as well and also remember that there should be no strabismus there should be no squint that means both the align both the eyes should be aligned properly in order to uh, develop a normal binocular single vision. Now let us talk about the advantages of the binocular single vision. So why is it important? Binocular single vision, it's right there in the name. It actually helps us to see single images. Otherwise, we will have diplopia, right? So first advantage is the advantage of single vision. The second advantage is that of stereopsis okay so basically you can see this is the two-dimensional image of a circle and this is 3d so that depth perception that you get in um, in three-dimensional objects in real life is basically because of the binocular single vision that depth perception is because we are able to use both our eyes simultaneously so that so the most precise kind of depth perception which is known as stereopsis is basically a gift of binocular single vision. Apart from that, binocular single vision actually helps us in enlargement of the field of view. So if we had only one eye, suppose over here we were using only the right eye, then our field of vision will be this much. Whereas if we were using only left eye, our field of vision will be this much. But here, since we are using both the eyes, our field of vision is quite greater right so using both eyes actually enlarges the field of vision okay now as a matter of fact it has been seen that patients who actually have exotropia they have much larger field of vision compared to a normal person right now using both eyes together can actually help us to compensate for blind spot and other differences as well. We know that the point from where the optic nerve leaves is actually known as the blind spot and because the optic nerve leaves nasally, the blind spot is always present somewhere in the temporal part of the visual field. Now, usually we don't see our blind spot 
and usually we don't see that black color spot it's called the, the scotoma because the blind spot that happens because there's also a significant amount of overlap between the two eyes so what happens is that this temporal scotoma is being compensated by the normal nasal field of the other eye and that is how using two eyes what is happening is that one eye is actually compensating for the defects of the other eye and that is one advantage of the binocular single vision now let us talk about the words grade of BSV. So there are three grades which actually helps us in identifying the degree of binocular single vision which is present in a particular patient. So these three grades are the ability to simultaneously perceive something that simultaneous perception, the ability to fuse those two images into one which is fusion and the ability to perceive the depth of the image, the ability to see it in a three dimensional structure which is called stereoscopic vision. So we shall be talking about them in detail but before that there are some important uh, terms and important points about the binocular single vision that we all need to know and let us see what are these. First, let us talk about the binocular fixation versus uniocular fixation. So what is meant by binocular fixation? Now, if we have an object in the visual field, for example, over here, this is the butterfly. If we look at the butterfly with both our eyes together, that is known as binocular fixation. And the image of the butterfly is being formed on the fovea of both the eyes. However, when only one eye looks at the object and the other eye is looking somewhere else, that means you are only fixating with one eye and the image is being formed on the fovea of that eye only, then that is known as uniocular fixation. Now, this would be the correct time to introduce you to the concept of visual direction. Now, basically, whenever the eye or the retinal area is stimulated by light entering from an object, the stimulus is perceived not only as being of certain brightness or color or form, but also as always being localized in a certain direction in the visual space. That means whether this hexagon is present superiorly, inferiorly, temporally or nasally in the visual field. So one cannot simply have a visual impression without seeing the object somewhere in the visual space. So what I mean to say is, for example, if the stimulated retinal area is located on the left side of the fovea, the image is going to be seen or the object is going to be seen in the right half of the field, okay, something like this. At the same time, if the stimulated retinal area is located on the right side of the fovea, the image is going to be localized on the left half of the visual field. So what I mean to say over here is that, that each and every point on the retina actually has this intrinsic direction associated to it okay and the direction in which a visual object is localized is determined by the direction or the spatial values of the stimulated retinal elements that you see over here in blue color right so this directional value or, or is basically an intrinsic property which is inherent to the retinal element of the retina right so it is something which is intrinsic or inherent to individual retinal elements in the retina okay and this is known as the local sign of lodze which basically helps you in localization of the various objects that we see in a normal day-to-day -day life it actually gives them a directional value or spatial orientation in the visual field so i hope that is clear now, if you have understood what is meant by visual direction, we can now go ahead and understand the retinomotor value of each retinal element. Now, suppose we have this eye and this is the fovea which is drawn in red color. The eye is looking straight ahead. So if the object is present straight ahead, the image will be falling directly on the fovea, right? However, if the image or the object suppose appears in the periphery of the eye, what will happen? The rays which are coming from this butterfly are not going to be falling on the fovea and instead they are forming outside the fovea. So what will the eye do in order to bring the image back on the fovea, which is a point of maximum precision or maximum, uh, you can say resolution. What will the eye do? The eye will actually try to turn towards the object so that the image is now straight away falling on the fovea right and this eye movement is actually called a saccade right so basically the 
movement of the eye wall that occurs in order to bring an object of interest which is present in the peripheral field back on the phobia is what uh, is is something that gives us the retinomotor value right so what i mean to say is that every retinal element actually has this retinomotor ability or retinomotor value right this retinomotor value of the retinal element actually increases as you go from the center towards the periphery so what i mean to say is if the object is falling straight away on the fovea there is no need for the eye to actually move towards it since the image is being formed straight away on the fovea right so the retinomotor value of the fovea is actually zero however as you move away from the center towards the periphery definitely the object is going to be now falling away from the fovea and therefore the retinomotor value will increase because the eye actually has to move subsequently more and more towards the object in order to bring it on to the fovea so that is what is meant by the retinomotor value so why are we actually talking about this it's important because first thing you should know that the fovea basically has a retinomotor zero point okay because it has zero value uh, uh, zero retinomotor value and this concept actually helps you in measuring the ocular deviation by the means of prism and cover test right so what we do in prism test and cover test is that as we cover the normal eye which does not have squint or strabismus the eye which actually has squint basically will now try to take a fixation and by taking taking a fixation what do i mean i mean that the eye which has squint basically would try to bring the object back on the fovea by making a movement towards the object and uh this way the squint gets corrected during a prism cover test right and here the basic principle which is underlying the prism cover test is also dependent on this retinomotor values of the retinal element so i hope that is clear so that's one clinical significant point let's try to understand what is meant by common relative subjective visual direction now all these words and terms they actually are a mouthful but they are very easy to understand trust me now let us try to understand this complicated term with a very simple diagram okay so here in this first picture you can see that f is basically the fixation point where the left eye is looking at and also the right eye is looking at and the image of the f is being formed where on the fovea of the respective eyes now individually these are the visual direction of the foveas of both the eyes but we know that the two foveas actually have a common direction and they are going to actually see this fixation point as a single point as if you have a cyclopean eye in the center okay and this is going to be the common direction of both the foveas now to test that if you place a square in front of the left eye like this along the visual direction of the left eye and if you place a triangle along the visual direction of the right eye what is going to happen you're actually going to localize the fixation point the square and the triangle all along one single line one behind each other right so basically all the object points that are simultaneously stimulating the two fovea they are appearing in one and the same subjective visual direction okay and since this direction was belonging to both the right fovea as well as the left fovea and therefore this direction is known, known as a common visual direction of the fovea and this common visual direction because it is seen by the patient it is known as the common subjective visual direction of the fovea so although the two foveas one was located here one was located here and their individual foveal directions were like this the visual directions were like this but their common subjective localization was along this straight line okay as if it as if there is a cyclopean eye and that common direction is known as the common subjective visual direction of the fovea so if you were to place a pencil here or a square here or a triangle here like this all of them are going to fall on this common visual direction so i hope this made sense and now i hope you understand what is a visual direction and what is a common subjective visual direction now this doesn't happen just with fovea so what i mean to say is obviously this fovea and this fovea are going to have have this common visual direction but apart from that every retinal point as a matter of fact which is present on retina 
is going to have a partner in the fellow eye or in the fellow retina with which it is going to share such similar common relative subjective visual direction. So what I mean to say is just like for fovea, this, this is one fovea, this was another fovea and the common subjective visual direction was like this. Similarly, suppose this is a point A on one eye, it will have a similar point A on the other eye as well. And they are actually going to have one common subjective visual direction at which they are going to basically localize the image that is seen, right? Similarly, this point B is going to have one corresponding friend on the other eye as B with which it is going to share this common relative subjective visual direction. So now I hope it is clear what is meant by visual direction and what is meant by the common subjective visual direction. So if that is clear, we can understand and proceed to correspondence. So what is meant by correspondence? Retinal elements of the two eyes, as I told you, they share a common subjective visual direction with one another point on the other eye. And these points which are sharing this subjective direction, these points, these uh, friendly points are known as the corresponding retinal points. Okay, so what I mean to say is fovea of both the eyes are corresponding to each other. The points which are located on the temporal half of the retina are going to correspond uh, to the points which are located on the nasal half of the other retina. The points which are located on the nasal half of one retina are going to actually correspond to the points which are located on the temporal half of the other eye's retina. Right? So all other retinal elements are non-corresponding or disparate with respect to a given retinal element in the fellow eye. So what I mean to say is A corresponds to A, B corresponds to B, but the A is not going to correspond to B and also A is not going to correspond with F or B is not going to correspond with F. So what I mean to say is these A points are corresponding, but A is not a corresponding point to B. So that's what I mean to say by non-corresponding point and corresponding retinal point. So I hope that is clear, right? So now if you understand what is correspondence, let us move ahead and understand what is meant by normal versus abnormal retinal correspondence. So retinal correspondence is basically called normal when fovea corresponds to fovea, nasal elements of one eye corresponds to temporal elements of the other eye and the temporal elements of one eye basically corresponds to the nasal elements of the other eye. Okay, so that is what is happening in the normal eye and this is called as the normal retinal correspondence. But, but we have a term and that is known as the abnormal retinal correspondence. Now, normally, in the normal retinal correspondence, the eyes are straight. They do not have any squint or any deviation. But sometimes in eyes which have very small amount of squint, we have seen that the fovea of one eye actually starts sharing a common visual direction with an extra foveal area of the other eye instead of sharing it with the fovea of the other eye. So in normal condition, what will happen? The fovea is going to correspond with the fovea of the other eye. But what happens in certain conditions, especially in microtropias or squints or in micro squints, what happens is that this fovea is going to start to find a common subjective visual direction with another point which is located adjacent to the fovea. And that point is extra foveal because obviously it's not foveal. So in such a condition when correspondence develops in this way, it is called an anomalous retinal correspondence or an abnormal retinal correspondence, right? And it is seen if the angle of squint is really, really small. For ARC to develop, the angle of squint should not be large. Since here you are seeing a fovea to extra foveal interaction, it is known as an abnormal retinal correspondence. For example, here the patient actually has a very little amount of, uh, what do you say, esotropia. Now, normally let us see what happens. If in this patient there was a normal retinal correspondence, what will happen? The rays of light are going to fall on the fovea like this in this eye, which is straightforward. Whereas in the other eye, since the eye is deviated inward, the ray of light is also going to form somewhere nasally. Now, we know that this fovea is only corresponding to this fovea. Okay, But if the ray of light is falling on this fovea, the image is located somewhere here. 
but this point here is not going to have the same subjective visual direction to the fovea and therefore the image is going to be localized somewhere else right somewhere temporally that is the reason why in such a patient if there was a normal retinal correspondence you are going to see two images and the patient will complain of diplopia however as a protective mechanism or as an attempt to regain that binocular advantage of binocular single vision what happens in these immature uh, visual systems is that the fovea is going to now start developing correspondence with this extra foveal point and now this image is going to be localized to the same spot and there will be no diplopia okay so this is actually a hint if you see a very small angle of deviation and the patient performs very well on binocular single vision tests you know that probably the patient has an abnormal retinal correspondence right so this results in the eyes actually seeing binocularly single in spite of having a manifest squint so can cover test actually reveal your abnormal retinal correspondence yes it can we will also discuss about various other investigations that can actually help you diagnose abnormal retinal correspondence now what exactly happens is that when the normal eye in which the fovea basically is forming the image is covered the other eye basically loses that advantage of abnormal retinal correspondence now the other eye which actually has squint it does not need to develop any common subjective visual direction with the fovea of the normal eye which is now covered right so therefore under monocular condition the eye moves back towards the center that means the fovea takes the command again and the central fixation is retained by the fovea and this actually forms the basis of cover test so even in an arc when you cover the normal eye that fovea to extra foveal correspondence is broken down the fovea of the eye which has squint takes back con its control and there is central fixation and the eye basically moves uh, the eye basically shows uh, shows a corrective movement and that is how you actually pick up your arc now what about the quality of bsv the quality of binocular single vision with abnormal retinal correspondence it actually varies sometimes you can have a really good stereopsis and sometimes the binocular vision is not very useful right and however the quality of the binocular single vision that a patient enjoys with the arc depends upon the angle of deviation obviously if the angle of deviation is small the correspondence that is going to develop between the fovea and the extra foveal point is going to be better and the arc arc is going to give better uh, is going to give better stereopsis to this patient however if the angle of deviation is larger the quality of binocular single vision is not going to be that good now let us talk about the concept of fusion basically we have two types of fusion sensory fusion and motor fusion first we shall be discussing about the sensory fusion an object localized in one or the same visual direction as we know by the two corresponding uh, by stimulation of two corresponding points on the retina will appear as a one single object right this unification of the visual excitations which are coming from the corresponding retinal images into a single visual object or percept a single visual image is known as sensory fusion right so what i mean to say is that an individual basically cannot see double with corresponding retinal elements being stimulated and therefore if a person is able to see single it means that it is actually a hallmark of retinal correspondence so single vision is a hallmark of retinal correspondence now this fusion the sensory fusion it is actually a central process and it always takes place in the visual center of the brain so we need to thank our brains for basically fusing those two images which are being formed individually by two eyes into one single image so there are certain requirements to sensory fusion the first requirement is that the cor the images should actually be formed on the corresponding areas of the retina that is the image should always be formed on the corresponding retinal points second point is that 
the images must always be of same size they must have same brightness and they should have similar sharpness whenever the unequal images are being formed they act as severe sensory obstacles to fusion as a matter of fact sometimes the obstacle to fusion actually becomes an etiology for the development of squint and therefore it is very important that these images are formed on corresponding points number one they should have similar shape they should have similar color brightness and sharpness for sensory fusion to occur and remember sensory fusion is occurring at the level of brain now at the same time it is also important to know that whenever the object is not being falling on this uh, corresponding point it means that they are falling on two not corresponding points as seen over here in this image you can see that the uh, right eye is basically deviated outwards and therefore the rays from that butterfly is actually falling on the temporal aspect of the fovea and therefore the image is formed somewhere uh, nasally and therefore you are seeing double images here and uh, therefore, we can say that double vision actually is the hallmark of retinal disparity or non-correspondence. So whenever there is correspondence, you have single vision. Whenever there is non-correspondence, you will basically have double vision. So we can say single vision is a hallmark of correspondence, whereas double vision is a hallmark of retinal disparity or non-correspondence. So now let us do an experiment. First, let us try to fixate binocularly on this object over here on your screen. So in this case, there is this pink butterfly. I'm sure that you're able to see this single. Okay, now what we do is now slightly put pressure on one of your eye with your finger, displacing one eye slightly by the pressure from your finger. Now what you will observe is that the so now the butterfly which appeared single before uh, pressure was applied to the globe is now seen in diplopia so you can actually see two butterflies now and this happens because as you put pressure on your globe what is happening is that you are actually displacing the globe and now this butterfly image is actually falling on the non-corresponding point instead of falling on the phobia of both the eyes and that is the reason why you are experiencing diplopia so I hope that makes it really clear as to what is meant by corresponding point, what is meant by non-corresponding point and how our brain actually fuses those images which are coming from the corresponding point and that is known as sensory fusion. Now let us talk about another fusion and that is the motor fusion. Now. So basically, motor fusion actually refers to the ability of the eyes to align themselves in such a way that the sensory fusion can actually happen in the brain. So when we talked about sensory fusion, we said that sensory fusion basically occurs at the visual cortex level in the brain. Whereas the motor fusion is a special ability of the eyes to align themselves in such a way that the image is actually formed on the fovea right now here the eyes will basically move based upon their retinomotor value so remember i explained to you what is meant by the retinomotor value and the retinomotor value of the fovea is zero okay so now let us try to understand this with an example now here in this case you can see that the right eye is actually slightly turned inwards and therefore the rays are not exactly falling on the fovea instead it is falling somewhere nasal to the fovea now in order to bring back this ray on the fovea the eye will rotate outwards and this is what happens the ray now falls on the fovea of both the eyes okay making the fusion possible okay so this is called motor fusion where the eyes itself are actually turning inwards or outwards in order to align them straight ahead and making the rays fall on the fovea and then your brain actually takes over and fuse them together and that is known as the sensory fusion right now what if the eye was actually deviated outwards then the ray of light is falling somewhere in the temporal area temporal to the fovea now anything away from the fovea has a retinomotor value and therefore now this eye will actually try to rotate inwards and bring back the image onto the fovea right so we need a proper alignment of the eyes that means there should be no strabismus the image must be of equal clarity and there should be presence of sensory and motor fusion for a normal binocular single vision to develop now let us understand how these corresponding points of the retina are actually projected in the visual field and to understand this we shall be talking about a very important concept and that is the concept of heropter 
So what is an heropter? The heropter basically means the horizon of vision and this term was introduced in 1613 by Aglonius. Now, let us understand Heropter with an example. Imagine yourself, uh, imagine that you are standing in an art gallery and you're looking straight ahead at a single painting. So that was going to be your fixation point. Now that painting definitely is going to appear single to you. Quite interestingly, the other paintings in the room which are present in your peripheral field will also appear single because they too are falling on their respective corresponding points on the retina of the two eyes, right? So basically our visual world is composed of multiple points and hence we need something to deal with the entire, with the whole visual space and not just with the fixation point. And this is where the concept of heropter comes in. So basically over here, all these paintings are actually falling on the corresponding points on the retina. So if you now actually join all the position of these paintings that means you join the locus of all these points you actually get this line and this line is known as heropter right so heropter is basically the locus of all those points in the space that project on corresponding locations in the two retina that means the anatomical identical points. so by now i'm pretty sure that you understand what are corresponding points now, according to this model, that is the wheat muller circle, basically the heropter can actually be drawn as a circle which passes through the fixation point here, okay, and the two center of rotation of the eye, okay. So, if you take the fixation point and the two center of rotation of the two eyes and you draw a circle, that is how you get basically a heropter, right. So, since in this, basically, uh, the heropter was circular in shape and therefore this is known as the wheat muller circle. Now, this circle actually becomes smaller if the point of fixation gets nearer. So, suppose this was the fixation point and there was an object over here, then definitely your heropter will also become smaller. So, as you approach closer to the fixation point, the circle gets smaller. The circle over here is known as the Wheat-Muller circle after the scientists who actually discovered this. And we can also say that the heropter basically gets smaller, right? Now, the Wieth-Muller circle actually is a theoretical heropter, okay? It is actually a calculated heropter, which, is, which basically assumes that all these points actually have an angular symmetry. What it means to say is that, suppose this is the point, now this point is going to form equal angles with the visual directions of the fovea. So, for, as a matter of fact, any point, if you take across this circle, if you are going to draw it like this, it's going to make equal angles with the uh, line which is joining the fixation point and the fovea that is a visual axis right so this is the assumption on which basically the wheat muller circle is dependent on and remember this is only a theoretical heropter however the empirical heropter curve that means the experimentally derived heropter it is seen that it is not as circular as the wheat muller circle which is the theoretical heropter instead it has a more longitudinal curve like this. It is more in the shape of an ellipse, okay? It means that it is slightly flatter than the Wheat-Muller circle. And you can also say that it has a greater radius of curvature compared to the Wheat-Muller circle, okay? So drawn over here in orange color is your empirical heropter. So it is very important to understand what is Wheat-Muller circle? Why is Wheat-Muller circle known as the theoretical heropter and what is the empirical heropter. Now, there is a difference definitely between the empirical heropter and the theoretical heropter. You can see over here, right? And that difference, this difference over here that you can see in the periphery basically, this deviation of the, uh, this deviation between the empirical and the theoretical heropter is known as the herrings hillebrands deviation. Now, you might ask that why is it so? Why do we see a difference between the uh, theoretical heropter and the uh, heropter which is calculated through experiments or practically which is known as the empirical heropter? The reason is that in the retina basically, we have more number of photoreceptors present on the nasal side compared to the temporal hemifield, right? Now, since there are more number of photoreceptor per unit area in the nasal retina compared to the temporal hemiretina, definitely the temporal field of view is going to be larger compared to the 
nasal field of view and that is the reason why you see this elliptical formation of the empirical horopter. You can see the temporal parts in the peripheral areas of the either side of the horopter. You can see they are much wider compared to the center and that happens because the photoreceptors which are located on the nasal side are much more in number compared to the temporal hemifields of the retina. Okay, so that is uh, that is one theory behind why we have this deviation known as the Herring's Hillebrand deviation. So I hope that is clear. Now let us discuss about another important concept. I'm pretty sure most of us would have heard about this term called Panum's fusional area. So now let us discuss about this thing. Now what did I tell you about horopter? A horopter is basically a line which is formed by joining all the loci of the uh, objects which fall on the corresponding points on the retina right but now objects uh, but actually speaking all the objects need not always be present on the horopter for us to be able to see them as single images right so what i mean to say is there's actually a narrow band or narrow zone which is situated in front of the horopter and behind the horopter in which we can actually visualize the images as single despite uh, there being a retinal disparity so what do i mean by that I mean, uh, I mean that despite objects falling on non-corresponding points, here the objects are going to appear single. Okay, and this zone is known as the Panum's fusional area. Now we know that if there's an object which is falling on the horopter, definitely the eyes are going to perceive it as single. However, look at this duck here or turkey, whatever it is. Now you can see this, this is actually falling beyond the horopter, but still we are going to perceive it as single. Similarly, here this turkey is falling in front of the horopter, but still it will appear to be single. And this turkey definitely is falling on the horopter, so it will be single, right? So these two lines represent the boundary of a zone in which despite having retinal disparity, that means despite the object not falling on corresponding points of the two retina, they will still be perceived as single. And this zone is known as the Panum's fusional area. Okay, so this zone over here, this zone, okay, so from here to here is a zone and this is known as the Panum's fusional area. So I hope that is clear. Now, again, you should remember that the Panum's fusional area is narrow in the center and then it, as you go towards the periphery, it gets broader. And the reason is that the foveal cone system have monosynaptic connections, whereas and as you go in the periphery, there are better connections or polysynaptic connection between the photoreceptors. So that is one reason why the Panum's fusional area is narrower in the center and broader in the periphery. So now what I mean to say is that if there's an object which is uh, falling beyond the Panum's fusional area, as you can see over here, this turkey is crossing this line. Now this will be seen as double. Okay. And similarly, if this turkey was uh, falling somewhere too ahead of the Panum's fusional area, again, you're going to perceive it as double. So objects within the Panum's fusional area and on the horopter will be perceived as single, whereas the objects which are beyond and to ahead of the Panum's fusional area will be perceived as double images. Okay, so I hope that is clear. Now the question is, how does this fusion actually occurs in this Panum fusional area? And this is the same concept of motor fusion, which I discussed before, right? So here, when the objects are falling on non-corresponding points within the Panum fusional area, the eye has the ability to align itself in such a way that the objects will fall on the fovea. And this is basically the strength of motor fusion, which helps uh, in fusing the images which are falling within the Panum's fusional area. So I hope that is clear. Now, after you have understa understood what is Panum's fusional area, I would like to explain what is meant by physiological diplopia. Okay, so physiological means that it occurs in normal individuals. It's just that we don't observe it in our day-to-day -day life, right? There's nothing wrong with the patient or there's nothing wrong with us if we actually observe this diplopia. So let us again try to understand Panum's fusional area and this physiological diplopia with an example. So I want you to sit straight maybe preferably uh, near a window from which you can see a tree or any large object at a far distance, right? Now I want you to hold a pen 
and what I want you to do is actually now to look uh, to look at this pen. Now you will observe that as you are looking at the pen, the object behind the pen that means say suppose a tree for example that will appear double. Next, I want you to focus on the tree and then keep a uh, keep an eye on the pen as well. So as you fixate on the tree, what will happen is that the pen or the pencil will now appear double okay so this is known as physiological diplopia it is normal it is a normal phenomenon what is basically happening here is that as you're fixating on the tree the tree is falling on the heropter or in the panels fusional area whereas the pencil now is outside the panels fusional area and therefore it is appearing as double to you at the same time, when you were fixating basically on the pencil, what was happening was the pencil was falling on the panels fusional area and whereas the tree basically comes outside the panels fusional area and therefore it appears double. There's nothing pathological in this. It is all physiological and therefore this diplopia is known as physiological diplopia. And usually we are unaware of this diplopia. It's only through these experiments that you actually get to know about them. Now let us take this a step ahead, okay? So now you're focusing on the tree or the distance object. As you focus on the distant object, what is happening? You're able to see two images of the same pencil, one image from each eye. Quite interestingly, however, here the images are crossed. So what I mean to say is that if you, if you actually close your right eye, what is going to happen is that the image on the left is going to disappear. At the same time, if you cross your left eye, the image on the right side is going to disappear. It means that the images over here are actually crossed. That means the right eye image is located on the left side and the left eye image is located on the right side. So therefore, you what it means that whenever you're looking at a far object, the images of the near object will look double and you, this is called physiological diplopia and this is basically a crossed physiological diplopia so i hope that is clear similarly now in this experiment now focus on your pencil so your panels fusional area is located around the pencil and the tree will now appear double in this case now if you cross if you occlude your right eye what will happen the right image will disappear and if you occlude your left eye the left image is disappearing that means the images are corresponding to the eye. That means here we have basically an uncrossed physiological diplopia. Okay. Okay. So that's all for today. I hope this video added some value to your life. If this video was useful to you, kindly hit that like button and share this video with your friends. That actually makes a lot of difference to us. So that's all for today. Thank you and have a nice day. If you liked our content, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Also, you can actually join our YouTube memberships. And I often get a question as to how do I join the membership? So let me demonstrate that to you now. In order to become a member of Insight Ophthalmology, first you need to watch any video of Insight Ophthalmology. For example, right now I'm watching this video on Mastering Iris Anatomy. So here below the video, you will see there are two buttons. One is a join button and one is subscribe button. So make sure you're subscribed to the channels. Okay, so this is what happens when you subscribe to the channel and uh, after that you can see that on the left hand side there's a join button so using this join button you can actually join the memberships so once you click on the button you will be able to see that there are three levels of memberships which are available and their perks are actually depicted on the right hand side of the uh, the dialog box so uh, so you can choose the membership which is best fit for you and once you actually choose it you can click on the join button and then you can do the purchase according uh, to the method which is best fit for you right so that's how you actually join these memberships and often I get a question that they're not people are not able to join memberships they're not able to see a uh, join button over here so the reason could be either you're not uh, logged in so make sure that you are logged in uh, into your YouTube account and the second thing that you need to uh, make sure is that sometimes the YouTube memberships might not be available in your country because of some security reason, reasons and because of some private policies of YouTube and the government in your country, right? So in those cases, uh, I also cannot help you. I really apologize. 
and that are not able to help you in that case right and for the rest of you who are lucky to see this join button you can go ahead and click on it and uh, that's all i hope it was useful thank you and have a nice day